On our newscast this Tuesday, the first reunions for families separated by the Korean War have come to an end after six days. We take a look back at the first reunion event in nearly three and a half years and how it might affect the future of inter-Korean relations. And North Korea breaks the silence it's maintained in recent weeks by violating the maritime border three times. Although there were no skirmishes, South Korean authorities say the move was no accident. President Park Geun-hye marks her one-year anniversary since being sworn into office with a televised address where she lays out the details of her three-year economic innovation plan. These and more on Early Edition at 6. It is 10 a.m. in Barcelona, 1 p.m. in Sochi, and 6 on a Tuesday evening here in Seoul. Welcome to Early Edition at 6. I'm Kim hyun -ji. And I'm Daniel Chen. Thank you for joining us. On Tuesday, the two Koreas wrapped up their two rounds of war-separated families at North Korea's Mount Kumgang. The families, many of whom are advanced in age, said their tearful goodbyes, which raises the question of whether they'll ever be given the right to meet again. Our Hwang Sung-hee reports. It was an emotional day at North Korea's Mount Kimgang on Tuesday as the two Koreas wrapped up their first reunion event for war-separated families in more than three years. For most, this could be the last time to see their families living on the other side of the border, as many are already over the age of 80. <laughs> <laughs> the six-day event was conducted in two rounds, with the first three days arranged by South Korea and the final three days arranged by the North. Experts say this rare show of cooperation between the Koreas could lead to a broader thawing of inter-Korean ties. It signifies the first step for improving inter-Korean ties and serves as a foundation for holding the family reunions on a regular basis and an occasion to show the world that the two Koreas can solve problems through dialogue. Upon holding a successful reunion event, the two sides had agreed to address additional humanitarian issues, such as making the family reunions a regular event and sending food and medical aid to the North. Such efforts come in line with President Park Geun hyes principle of approaching softer issues before addressing more serious matters, like North Korea's nuclear program. Experts say if the Koreas maintain the momentum for dialogue, the possibility of a North Korean provocation is low. Reflecting on previous cases, there was almost no provocation by North Korea when there was inter-Korean dialogue or cooperation. Even if there was, it was resolved very quickly. On the second day of the joint military drills between South Korea and the United States, North Korea has yet to criticize its southern neighbor. Pang sang Arirang News. While the two Koreas were conducting inter-Korean family reunions, a North Korean military patrol ship crossed the maritime border in the West Sea three times between just before 11 p.m. Monday night and 3 a.m. Tuesday morning. South Korea's defense ministry said Tuesday that the North Korean vessel crossed back and forth beyond the northern limit line, the de facto maritime border between the two Koreas, on three different occasions, venturing as far as three and a half kilometers into the zone. The South Korean military sent high-speed patrol boats to the area after warnings were ignored by the North, although there were no skirmishes. The boat turned back at around 2.30 this morning. The ministry says that it is highly likely that the North sent the boat to the area on purpose, since it ignored warnings and lingered for a long time. The nation's umbrella labor group staged simultaneous rallies on Tuesday in protest of the Park geun administration. The question is, of course, why, and our Connie Kim explains what they are rallying for. The one-year anniversary of President Park's inauguration was not met with celebration by the nation's unions. 
Some 50,000 workers from the Korean Confederation of Trade Unions turned out in force at Seoul Plaza on Tuesday afternoon in protest of the Park Geun-hye administration, which it claims has been oppressing workers and moving to privatize public firms. The afternoon rally follows similar ones throughout 12 cities earlier on Tuesday. In the morning, members of the Korean Railroad Corporation staged a one-day walkout. They are demanding that the state-run railway operator withdraw charges against unions who took part in strike in December, which was launched in protest of a government plan that would create a subsidiary to run a high-speed train line. The union claims the plan is a first step toward the privatization of CorRail. Despite the protest, there were no inconveniences causing railway operations since CorRail had planned ahead and dispatched some 1,800 replacement workers. The greater protest organized by the Korean Confederation of Trade Unions was expected to draw some 200,000 people, but just 50,000 took part, mainly because the core labor union of Hyundai Motor and Kia Motors decided not to join in. The government has warned of stern measures against those taking part in what it calls an illegal walkout and notifies citizens to take public transportation to avoid traffic jams caused by the protests on the streets. Connie Kim, Arirang News. One year ago today, President Park Geun-hye was sworn in as Korea's 11th president. She marked the occasion on this Tuesday with a televised address to the nation. The president laid out the details of her three-year economic innovation plan. Our presidential office correspondent, Ah Jin-ju, has the details. Reunification of the two Koreas will be a bonanza. In line with this comment made in her New Year's address, President Park announced plans to set up a presidential reunification preparation committee to seek out ways to bring about what she called a systematic and constructive reunification. The committee will operate beyond the purview of the Unification Ministry, with experts and civic groups from various sectors, ranging from foreign affairs and security to the economy and culture, drawing up a specific blueprint for a unified Korea. In her three-year economic innovation plan unveiled in Tuesday's address, President Beck vowed to raise the nation's potential economic growth rate to above 4 percent and per capita income to $40,000 by the year 2017. She put forth three goals creating an economy with strong fundamentals, making an innovative and dynamic economy, and establishing an economy that balances domestic demand and exports. The president says she will start with rooting out abnormal policies and wrong practices, especially in the public sector. President Beck pledged to reduce and cap the debt ratio of public institutions at 200 percent, which is the upper limit for private companies to issue corporate bonds. The Korea Land and Housing Corporation, for example, which has debts of more than $128 billion, had a debt ratio of over 400 percent as of last year. And for an innovative economy, she also promised to increase investment in research and development to 5 percent of the country's GDP by 2017. Boosting domestic demand comes as an important part of her goal for a balanced economy. The president set a target of reducing the nation's household debt ratio by five percentage points by 2017 by handing out tax benefits and introducing fixed interest rates and level debt services for mortgage loans. Oh Jin Chu, Ajitang News. Staying with the topic of President Park's three-year economic innovation plan, the presidential office of Cheong Wade has given the public a better understanding of how it aims to steer toward a 4 percent potential growth rate by the year 2017. And for an in-depth discussion of this topic and more, Dr. Yi Duan, professor of economy at Yonsei University, joins us in the studio. Dr. Yi, welcome to the program. Good welcome. to be here. 
Exactly one year ago today, President mm -hmm. Park Geun-hye took office. Uh, so looking back her first year as president, uh, how do you evaluate the Park administration's performance on the economic front? Uh, what scorecard would you mm -hmm. give? Well, if you recall, the original plan of President Park when she was inaugurated was to achieve the employment rate of 70% by relying on two key policies. And those two key policies were achieving economic democratization and also to achieve creative economy. However, uh, after one year has been passed, the result is rather disappointing. If you look at the uh, growth rate, it's been 2.8% uh, last year, which is a lot shorter from our potential growth rate. And also, the employment rate hardly changed at all. So this disappointing result had been reflected in major surveys conducted by some press. Well, Professor, could you maybe point out some of the key points of the government's mm -hmm. three-year economic innovation plan? And I guess it's no accident that it's being announced and highlighted on this mm -hmm. anniversary. Exactly, yes. Well, uh, she proposed basically three key strategies. And in order to implement these uh, three uh, strategies, she also proposed nine uh, action plans. And if you look at those three uh, strategies, they include uh, establishing an economy with principle and also to achieve a dynamic and innovative economy. And lastly, to attain a balance between domestic demand and export. And these are the three pillars of her uh, new vision for the next three years. And in order to implement these uh, three pillars of vision, she proposed nine action plans. And on top of those nine action plans, in the end of her speech, she also proposed a plan to coordinate unification. So with this uh, ambitious economic mm -hmm. innovation plan, do you think the PAC administ administration will make up for the relatively poor performance on the economic front, as you, you know, said? Well, if they are well implemented, yes, of course. Uh, if you look at those action plans, they kind of summarize almost every proposal that economists and policy uh, uh, makers had been uh, proposing for the last one year. So if those action plans were well implemented, then I think we, it is going to make a big difference. But, you know, as, as people used to say, the devils are always in the details. And once we go into the details, then there are many things that we have to uh, uh, tackle with. Now, there will be a resistance from interest group. And also, there will be some conflict between each action plan. Some action plan might have a conflict with the other action plan. And the thing is, how the uh, government and how the president is going to coordinate this conflict. Right, as you pointed out, Dr. Lee, there will be times when they will have to improvise, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps make necessary changes along the way, other than just the nine action plans they've laid out. Uh, in your opinion, what more could we do to perhaps uh, work out all the nooks and crannies and mm -hmm. make sure we ac accomplish the goal? Yes. Well, as I just mentioned, uh, they, they may face some conflicts in the process of implementing those plans. So whenever there is a conflict, it's very important that you have to set a priority. So n out, of n out of these nine action plans, I think the next job of the president is to set the priority. You know, you cannot do everything within three years. So you, it's very important to set the priority first. And the other thing is, in order to implement these action plans, we need money. President proposed a lot of uh, proposals to increase the support to the labor market, to the small and medium-sized companies, to the service sectors. So in order to provide these support from the government, government need to increase more revenue. And she actually did not mention anything about how to finance those plans. So you hinted that these various interest groups mm -hmm. may oppose the government's push to really, you know, uh, realize these goals, mm -hmm. these economic goals. So, and I think uh, this administration has been, uh, you know, evaluated as kind of poor in terms of, you know, communicating with other sectors. Mm -hmm. So communication, it seems like, will be very important mm -hmm. for the government to push these uh, ideas. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, that's true. Uh, communication was very important. Uh, especially, I think it's, it'll be even more important from today. 
uh, it's, if you really want to implement these action plans, it's, it's really vital to get some cooperation from the political parties in the National Assembly, especially cooperation from the opposition party will be essential. Also, you may face some resistance from the uh, uh, other uh, group of uh, economic actors, such as labor unions. So getting a cooperation or understanding from the uh, labor union will be also important as well. And of course, a, a full support from the private sector, especially from the large companies, will be essential to implement these plans. Well, I'm going to have to ask you a very uncomfortable question. I guess sure. a lot of people are waiting to see what will happen. We talked about privatization, of course, is mm. key. And then, of course, we have the vitamin M, or money, mm. always being the issue. In order to solve that problem, does it involve tax hikes? Well, uh, personally, I think we need to talk about increase of tax revenue uh, in the near future. Maybe not today, but in the near future. But uh, in order to fulfill all of these plans, I think it is inevitable for us to increase our tax revenue. But the thing is, how to increase this, this uh, tax revenue and how fast we increase this tax revenue, that's a totally different matter. Right, there has to be some less painful ways to go around doing it. So I guess we'll, we'll have to squeeze Well, unfortunately, I don't think there will be no such a, a, no such a way mm. uh, that, that, uh, that we, uh, we do not go through a pain. I mm. think uh, uh, no pain, there will be no gain. No gain. Relativity, I guess, is key. <laughs> Relatively speaking, yes. If you do it gradually, maybe it's going to leave some pain out of uh, our shoulder, but eventually we will have to burden it. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Lee, for joining us today and for that wonderful uh, discussion. Uh, that was Dr. Lee Du Wan, professor of economy at Yonsei University, joining us in this studio. Buried under massive amounts of debt, Korea's state-owned enterprises are looking for a way out. The people that run the corporations appeared before lawmakers on Tuesday to explain just how they plan to go about doing it. Our National Assembly correspondent Jim Young-gil has more. Fourteen CEOs from state-owned enterprises were front and center at a policy briefing of the Parliamentary Land Committee on Tuesday where they emphasize that their focus is on reducing debt and improving management. The Korean Land and Housing Corporation is the most indebted public firm. We plan to work closely with the committee's lawmakers in reforming our institution. CoRail continues to ask us which assets to sell off this year's for debt repayment in line with the government's reform drive. Public companies have been under fire for handing out what many see as excessive bonuses, benefits and perks to their employees, despite mounting debts and deteriorating business conditions. To reverse the tide, the Korea Railroad Corporation and Korea Electric Power Corporation plan to offload real estate assets and shares to the tune of 1.7 billion US dollars and 1.4 billion dollars respectively. The Korea Expressway Corporation has similar plans, but will also be reforming the main source of its revenue. After repaying our debt by selling assets and restructuring, we're looking at the price of toll gate fees, which is one of the main causes for our deficit. The members of the Parliamentary Land Committee listened to the plans and suggested that state-run corporations do more business with smaller enterprises when starting new projects. Lawmakers also urge CEOs to take comprehensive public sector reforms, such as selling non-core assets, reducing excessive benefits to workers, and streamlining their overall business structure to resolve the worsening debt problem. Kim young Arirang News. We have some disappointing numbers. One quadrillion won, or 950 billion U.S. dollars. That's how high household debt in Korea reached as of the end of last year, a hike of $25 billion from just three months earlier. Data released Tuesday by the Bank of Korea suggests that a jump in housing transactions is at least partly to blame. Household credit growth picked up at least at its fastest pace rather in seven quarters in the fourth quarter of 2013, thanks to government measures that boosted housing transactions, which surged even more in January. Household credit refers to credit purchases and loans for households that have been extended 
by saving banks and commercial lenders. The success of the Korean film industry has not gone unnoticed in Hollywood, with a number of movies having been remade with American audiences in mind. Our Hwang Ji-hye reports on the potential of Korean films and television series and the challenges that remain. This lakeside path looks quite familiar. It's a scene from the 2006 American romantic drama Lake House, which was a remake of the Korean film Shiwore. The publication writes of around 30 Korean films have been sold in Hollywood over the past 15 years, and some of them were remade, including classics like Old Boy, My Sassy Girl, and The Uninvited. Roy Lee, a well-known American film producer known for taking Asian films and remaking them for audiences in the United States, says he was surprised by the production values and storylines in Korean movies. They were also original stories that I had never seen before done in, in English. And so uh, when I saw, saw movies like My Wife is a Gangster or The Lake House, or it was called uh, El Mare at the time, I just thought that those are movies I would want to see myself if they were in English. The adaptations of Korean films, however, have yet to find widespread success in the U.S. market, as Americanized versions often end up being drained of the weirdness that made them so popular in Korea. And industry sources say that writers and directors of the original Korean content should also participate in the remaking process in Hollywood to increase the chances of the new version being a success. I think they have to share their uh, passion and also the, about the whole movie uh, insight so that they understand fully, then they recreate, not remake. And it's not just Korean films that are being eyed by Hollywood producers. Korean TV series are also getting attention. Nine have already been picked up by Fake Empire Productions, the company behind a number of hit shows like Gossip Girl and The O.C. Hollywood uh, definitely looks to Korea as, as like a trendsetter in Asia because a lot of the TV shows and movies that are popular in Korea are also popular in Japan and in China. Roy Lee adds that as long as the Korean movie industry continues to take chances with new contents, it will have a marketplace worldwide. Hwang Jie, Arirang News, Los Angeles. The athletes that represented Team Korea at the Winter Olympics in Sochi returned home on Tuesday. Korea sent 71 competitors, its largest group ever, to the Games and had a participant in every sport except for hockey. The athletes came back to the country sporting three gold, three silver and two bronze medals. That was good enough for 13th place overall in Sochi, although one more gold would have put Team Korea in the top 10, which was its goal before the games began. Figure skating queen Kim hyun and the other athletes were greeted with a hero's welcome at Incheon Airport with flashing cameras and a wave of applause. Shifting gears now, when the 2014 ITU Plenipotentiary Conference opens this October in Korea's southern port city of Busan, Arirang TV will be its official global broadcaster. Science Minister Che Moon Gi and Arirang TV CEO Sun Jie signed an MOU on Tuesday, which states that Arirang TV will promote the international conference alongside with the Korean Broadcasting System and Yonhap News Agency. Internet provider KT and Korean Airlines will also be promoting the event. The conference will be held in Busan from October 20th to November 7th with an estimated 3,000 officials and experts from 193 member states attending to discuss global issues related to telecommunications. Let's get a check on the forecast with our Michelle Park at the Weather Center. Michelle, the high levels of ultra-fine dust continue and it's something people need to take seriously. That's right. I haven't seen enough, nearly enough people wearing masks on their way out in this kind of air quality. You know, I don't like wearing masks. How long do you think this condition will continue? 
Well, unfortunately, the fine dust advisory is still in effect and the high levels of ultrafine dust over the nation are going to continue tomorrow before slowly easing as we, as we get some rain down south. So let's bear with it just for another day. Tomorrow is generally going to be another warm day with a slightly cloudy skies. Now going over to our readings. Uh, so uh, Saru will start partly be cloudy, starting off the morning at 1 degrees before getting up to 15 in the afternoon. Meanwhile, the southern cities such as Daegu and Busan will both peak at 11 degrees. Now down on Jeju Island, we can expect a gloomy day with rain hitting up to 12 degrees. Tokto also makes it up to 10 and Mount Kimgang drops down to minus 1. Well, that's all I have for you today. I'm Michelle Park and have a wonderful evening. Thank you for that, Michelle. And that brings us to the end of our newscast. Thank you for watching. This has been Daniel Cha. And I'm Kim Yanji. Thank you, as always, for being here with us. We'll see you right back here, same time, tomorrow.